What is up guys, Dr. Gooden here, and in this video we are going to talk about the foot and the ankle joints. I'm really excited because this is the last section that we are going through in structural kinesiology. And I hope that these overviews of these body regions have been helpful to you as you've been learning the anatomy, learning the structure and the function of your body. Okay, let's learn about our bodies. Okay, so this comes from the Manual of Structural Kinesiology by R.T. Floyd, presented by Dr. Jacob Gooden. That's me. Now the ankle and the foot region, this is a very complex region of the body, and it's important for you to know that we are going to brush the surface of this region. We'll talk about the major joints and some bony landmarks and the musculature, but there is a lot that I will leave you to uncover in other classes, other investigations as you go further in your kinesiology career. But this should give you a good overview of these structures. Okay, so we have 26 bones and 19 large muscles in this region. We have very, uh, a very large number of small intrinsic muscles that we're not going to talk about, <clears throat> and more than 100 ligaments. Now, because we use the foot and ankle every day and nearly constantly when we're not seated for support and propulsion, we tend to run into foot trouble fairly commonly. So poor foot mechanics can lead to discomfort not only in the foot but up the kinetic chain as well. And there's really no substitute for adequate muscular development, strength, and proper foot mechanics. So there's no pair of shoes you can buy, no orthotics you can get, no tape job that you can have the athletic trainer put on your foot, no brace that will make up for weakness or poor mechanics of the foot and the ankle complex. Now here's a brief overview of the walking gait from heel strike to toe off. And you can see on that closer leg, it's shaded in in pink. We start with that initial heel strike and then into the loading response, mid stance and terminal stance phases and then the toe off or pre-swing. So what's not shown here is the swing phase where your foot repositions to begin another heel strike. Now during that heel strike, the foot should be in supination and we're gonna talk about what that looks like, what that supination movement looks like later. And then during mid stance, the foot should be moving into pronation. And then finally, as toe off follows mid stance, the foot should return to supination. So I'm sure you've heard before, if you've gone to a running store or something, you've probably seen motion control shoes, right? Anti-pronation shoes. And the salesperson might be trying to sell you on a pair of motion control shoes or shoes for people with high arches, etc. And that's all fine, but it's important to remember that pronation is not a bad thing. Overpronation can be negative and it can poorly affect your gait mechanics and it can lead to chronic overuse injuries. But we do need some pronation. I often see pronation sort of vilified in lay articles about running or about about what types of shoes you should buy for runners because I like to geek out about that stuff. Um, but it's important to know we, we strike the ground in supination, roll into pronation, and then back into supination as we toe off. And that's really what helps our foot function more like a spring and a shock absorber than just some big mound of meat that we're slapping on the ground. Now the next phase that we can see here uh, is the swing phase. And so really the foot isn't doing much while it's in the air, it's just repositioning as you walk. Now as you're running it's a little bit different. The foot is not only repositioning but at the last second before foot strike you, your lower leg and foot should be pre-tensing to develop tension so as they contact the ground your foot is more like a loaded spring and again less like a hunk of meat just slapping the ground. And that loaded spring will help you have a better energy return into your next stride. But as you're walking, the swing phase, there's minimal activity going on at the foot and ankle. Now problems can arise if the foot is too rigid and does not pronate. So if you don't pronate, that's bad. Or if the foot remains in pronation past mid stance. Right, so I'm sure you've seen people with either a low or a high arch, so low arch or a high arch of their foot, and we'll look at some pictures of this later, where that navicula is dropped down to the ground for low arches or really high and rigid for high arches, and both of those can be a negative thing. 
Now, as we're talking about walking versus running gait, it's important to know that the distinction between the two is that when you're walking, one foot will always be in contact with the ground. So as you take a step and you're going through the swing phase on your right leg, your left leg is on the ground. And as you heel strike on your right leg, your left leg is not yet in the air, but it's at toe off, ready for its swing phase. And then it goes through its swing phase once your right foot is on the ground. On the other hand, when you're running, there's a point at which both feet are off the ground, unless you're shuffling. If you're doing the shuffle, right, the sprinter shuffle as we used to call it, as the sprinters would quote unquote jog around the track, um, they would kind of have both feet, or you know, one foot in contact with the ground at all times. And that's okay because sprinters don't necessarily need to jog. Uh, they just need to get their blood flowing before they do their warm up. Have you guys ever watched race walking? Race walking is a great example of this. And in my opinion, one of the oddest sports there is. So imagine being in a race, right? And in this race, your job is to get to the finish line as fast as possible. But there are certain rules in the race that limit the amount of speed that you can attain. Certain rules imposed on the way you can move from point A to point B, right? It's as if there was a NASCAR race and they said, hey, let's have this NASCAR race with these super fast race cars that are capable of going you know, 200 miles an hour, but we're going to keep you in first gear the whole time. You can't shift out of first gear. You have to stay in first or else you're disqualified. So race walking is similar in that you have to have one foot on the ground at all times in order to qualify as being uh, walking still. In order to increase the pace at which these racers can walk, they have to have in very interesting walking mechanics. So they definitely change their walking mechanics, but they do so without ever getting to the point where both feet are off the ground at the same time. And there's even judges all along the course and they're evaluating and monitoring, oh, you know, did that person's, both of their feet come off? If so, let's flag them and give them a warning. It's just a really interesting sport and it looks kind of silly as well. So apologies if you're a race walker. It's a hard sport, definitely tough, but interesting in my opinion. It's also not great for your hips, or so I've heard. Okay, so here we have a superior and inferior view of the bones of your foot, and it's separated into the forefoot, midfoot, and rear foot. Starting at the rear foot, we have the calcaneus, which you can see highlighted there, and you have a nice view of the tuberosity of the calcaneus, which is essentially your heel bone, below which you have a fat pad and a lot of thick skin so that it can um, take a beating as you walk. And superior to that, we have the talus, which together with the calcaneus makes up the subtalar joint. Distal to both of those, we have the navicular, which if you can locate the navicular, you can do a navicular drop test and you can um, you know, determine how high or how low your arch tends to sit. Now distal to those, we have the midfoot comprised of the three cuneiforms, medial, intermediate, and lateral as well as the cuboid. Now as we travel out to the metatarsals, you can think of these as analogous to the metacarpals of your hand. And then finally we have your toes, which again are similar to your hand in that your big toe or your great toe only has a distal and proximal phalanx, whereas the other toes have a distal middle and proximal phalanx. Now the joints of the toes have a similar nomenclature to those of the fingers. We have the MP or metatarsophalangeal joints, the DIP or distal interphalangeal joints, and in the middle the PIP or proximal interphalangeal joints. Oh, also note that the mid and rear foot are comprised of what we call tarsal bones, and those are analogous to the carpal bones of your wrist except for you can obviously tell that they're much bigger because they're load-bearing and they have a different morphology, but they are all kind of round and chunky, cuboid in shape, similar to your carpal bones. Now each of your feet has three arches, a medial longitudinal arch, a lateral longitudinal arch, and a transverse arch. As your body weight is transferred from the tibia to the talus, talus and to the calcaneus, these three arches together allow the distribution of your weight forward and the capturing of some of that energy to be used again in toe off. 
Now some more bony landmarks to look at. We have the distal malleoli of the tibia and the fibula. So here they are down here. They're enlarged and they protrude horizontally and inferiorly. So you can see them here, the styloid processes of each of them. And these serve as a pulley for posterior tendons that increases mechanical advantage when performing inversion or eversion muscle actions. So you can think of them as similar to the patella in that they lengthen the moment arm that the muscle is pulling through. Now the base of the fifth metatarsal right here is an important bony landmark. It's enlarged and prominent because it serves as the insertion for peroneus brevis and tertius. Now it's common to fracture this part of the fifth metatarsal. Unfortunately, it's called a base fracture or a Jones fracture, and they're somewhat hard to heal. And it's common because it's, it protrudes so much and you have the, uh, all that tension on it from the peroneus brevis and tertius. And funny story, my wife actually broke her fifth metatarsal this last summer. We were at my little sister's wedding. We were dancing. Backstreet Boys came on. And, you know, the, the dancing got a little bit crazy. And luckily, it wasn't a Jones fracture. It actually fractures it, fractured it kind of diagonally right in there. But it was a bummer. She couldn't run for a long time, which she loves to do. So beware of the Backstreet Boys if you're at a wedding and you're having fun. And it comes on, especially Backstreet's Back, All Right, that song classic song, but just, you know, don't jump too high. Don't come down wrong on your foot. Okay, that wraps up the foot and the ankle joint bony landmarks. So th remember, this is just an intro. There are so many more structures in there for you to explore, but I just wanted to give you an orientation to get your bearings with these structures. In the next video, we'll be talking about the joint movements of the foot and the ankle, and they're a little bit complex. You know, we'll talk about pronation and supination. We'll talk about inversion and eversion and what that looks like at those joints. So check that out over here to keep learning or check out any of the other videos in the Structural Kinesiology playlist. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. Let me know if you have questions in the comments and I'll see you on the next video.